Hello. So let's start with an imaginative sort of story. So let's say your, your company receives a bug report through, through the forums. Like, who, no one pays attention to the forums, right? And, and it's just some, some user says, hey, sometimes whenever I upload a file, like, or this file I'm uploading, it, it seems to be all, like, I can't open it. It's Microsoft Word. And, and so you, you dig into this. So it's your job. Like, this task gets assigned to you, just a bug report. Um, and, oh, it looks like this block, this user's file is all zeros. Um, that's a little bit strange, but I hope we can fix this. I'll figure out the root cause. And it turns out a million users are affected. And, oh my goodness, this is like a sub zero. It's a durability incident. The company's going to go down in flames. I, maybe not in flames, but I do sometimes like to use the term like company ending incident, um, which is, it's really terrifying. And you should be terrified. Um, and that's, that's what this talk is all about. And so I'm the tech lead on Dropbox's block storage um, reliability team. Um, and I'm here to talk about a particular problem that we deal with in making sure that we stay durable and protect our users' data. So the goal of this talk, I'm going to expose what this problem is and how we have some gaps, and then offer some examples of how Dropbox solves this, and then offer some patterns that maybe could fit your company and your team in solving this kind of problem. Oh, did this work? Nope, I broke the check the thing. Guess I'm using the... Okay, so here's like a quick agenda for this little session. Talking through some problems, talking through some example solutions, and then like the generic model, like kind of if we take a step back and see how we solve this, how can you solve it the same way? So let's think of some kinds of bugs. Our garbage collector had a rarely hit off by one bug. And the result of that is we remove user data that shouldn't have been deleted. Yikes. Or the erasure encoding library we use. It's actually not thread safe. Maybe not documented anywhere. Or maybe it was supposed to be thread safe. And what happens is in a small portion of re-encodes, we would corrupt our user's data. Yikes, uh, trend here. Here's another one. As data passes through a particular machine, like app server 35, 35, I hate you, but whatever, um, it flips some of the users, some bits of user data as it goes through. How could we have seen that coming? Um, we really can't. And so, so these are all like terrifying types of events that lead, could lead to loss of user data um, and cause a durability incident, which I define as something that you can't recover from. Um, and so the problems I described, they fit into certain buckets of problems that don't get caught by unit tests or integration tests or right time assertions, um, normal ways that we prove that our systems are actually correct. Um, so in this case, it was like conditions of scale. Like we have so many boxes and so much like code running that in a small percent of cases, something bad happens. Or race conditions. Um, which also kind of can bite us at scale. We kind of, unit tests definitely don't protect us against race conditions, and sometimes we think our integration tests do, but really race conditions are more likely to manifest in production, and we need to make sure that in production we have protections against them. And then hardware unreliability is another one, which I don't think I need to say too much. It'll like bite you without you even thinking about it. So those are some stories just to try to freak you out a little bit. So, so what do we do at Dropbox? We have, we have these checker systems. And the idea behind our checker systems are that we look for the symptoms of those bugs periodically, all the time. We can't check for them just in our testing environment because we're not going to find them. So we check them in production. So here's a few examples of checker systems. Um, so here's the, the block scrubber. So we have hundreds of thousands of hard drives in Dropbox block storage. And all of them, I guess in like really simplified form, look like that. Um, we have like this long, long table of checksums and blocks for pieces of user data. And what we do to check that, I guess like what we're worried about here is that when we read the blocks, the blocks might not actually have what we remember putting into them. Or maybe some other operation in our code has mutated the blocks and made them unreadable. So, Every single hard drive has a background process that 
loops through every single block, reads it up, recomputes a checksum, compares it against that checksum, and reports if that failed or not. And that, that falls through to let us know whether, hey, like, this data is here, and we can actually use it. Here's another one that's a bit different, also within block storage. So in block storage, we, we have the, I guess I mentioned, like we have hundreds of thousands of hard drives, cool, whatever. Um, we have this one um, sharded database that describes for every block of data, which servers is that block of data actually on? So it's, it's a list of servers. Um, and so what we do here, I guess what we're worried about is that the servers in that list won't actually have the block of data that we're looking for. And so what do we do? Well, it's very similar to the block case. Um, we loop through every single one of these records, and we query these servers and say, hey, do you have this block? Um, and that convinces us that, hey, like in the future when a user request actually has us do this lookup, the data will be retrievable. Here's another one at another layer. Notice that we're kind of stepping out like one layer every time. Every single database has its own checker. This is the file system verifier. So in Dropbox, the file systems are organized as, as these file trees. And file trees are logs, um, logs of mutations that happen over time. So whenever like a user moves a file, that adds a log entry to the list of uh, mutations for that particular tree. So for this, and I'm just going to say this to like hammer in the redundancy, we're just going to loop through every single file tree and run a bunch of different checks against each. So the checks in this case are, some of them, I guess you'll think they seem crazy. Um, one of them is, do we have two rows in this log that are marked as the latest row? Um, if we have more than one, then this is broken. Supposedly, like, you don't think that should happen. Like, the code should protect us against that. Well, it doesn't. Race conditions can cause this. Another one is, does the file size on this file actually match the sum of the sizes of the blocks inside? It seems crazy, but these bugs can manifest due to race conditions when we mutate files. And so doing these checks actually protect us against these problems. Um, and so what's the pattern here? It's, it's not something like particularly crazy. We have this unit, this record, that we want to check to make sure it's sane. And we're, going to, we're just going to loop through every single one of them and run a sanity check. The sanity check depends on whatever we're, like, whatever we're checking over. But really, it should be pretty much the same as whatever is going to happen in a user request. Um, the main quirk to this kind of problem is just we have a lot of checks. If we have hundreds of thousands of hard drives, we need a checking system to check the data for hundreds of thousands of hard drives. So you can imagine like, systems like Nagios, where it's just a check runner that runs over servers and like, some checks per server. The main difference here is just we're checking data, and the scale is particularly high compared to those server checks. So. That was the beginning of the talk, and here's really, I guess, like the second half or the last third. You can think of it either way. Um, I've talked about the problem, which is that you shouldn't trust the data that is in your databases once you write that. Then I've given some examples to say, hey, this is what we at Dropbox do. Like, it seems crazy to like not trust your databases, but like we really don't trust our databases. Um, hopefully, I've sold you on the thought that you shouldn't trust your databases. <coughs> Um, so now I want to tell you a bit of like the framework. Like, what is, what are the patterns in building this kind of system, and where can you just like plug in your own system when where this is relevant? So let's talk data model. We start with the concept of a unit. Um, the unit is whatever you're actually scanning through or checking. So in the um, in the hard drive case, it's blocks of data. In like the file system case, it is file system trees. Great, so we're going to scan through all of these units. Every single unit is going to have a series of checks run against it. In some cases, there's only going to be one check. Like, um, read this block and compare it against the checksum. That's your check. And in some cases, 
your, your data is going to be checked by several types of checks, like in the file system case. Um, regardless, I guess you can think of it as a list of checks where sometimes there's only one check. These checks should output this notion of a violation or some sort of failure. And the existence of one violation means that there's something terribly wrong and we need to fix it or else user requests aren't going to be able to read their data. From there, I guess there's the thought of how do we schedule these checks to make sure that we can actually run them against all this data. So the first part um, in that, I guess, problem is to partition your data. So we take all of our databases and we break them into independent partitions. So for um, the block, like the hard drive case, every single hard drive is its own partition in a sense. So I'm in, in like the hash database case, every shard of MySQL that we use is a partition. So this separates your units into different isolated groups that can be scanned independently. Finally, we attach the notion of a run to one scan through the entire data set. Um, at Dropbox, we found that, I guess we had originally have these loops that just like loop through like the whole database, like each partition independently over and over. And it became very hard to understand when did we actually scan the entire data set? Like, I guess we want to know the scan began on Monday and ended on Thursday before on Friday the next scan run um, began. So with the notion of a run, um, you can actually operationalize this and make it easy to reason about, I guess, when the data was correct and when it started to not any longer be correct. Um, so check scheduling. Split the data set into partitions. That's going to make it actually possible to scan through the data. For each partition, maintain a cursor. So this is, I guess, like we have the whole data set, and this is how far through the data set we've already scanned. And then finally, hand out these cursors to check runners. So you can use any sort of distributed worker system, and this talk's not about distributed worker systems, but you're going to hand out cursors to these check runners. These check runners are going to scan over and check some batch of data, and they're going to move the cursor forward. Um, in terms of like your database that maintains these cursors, it looks something like this. In this particular run, these are where our cursor's at for these partitions. And when you hand out the cursor to check runners, you can hand them out with an API that looks something like this. Hey, here's the cursor for this partition. Send me back all the violations you find. It could be, could be none. I, I hope it's none. Um, and pass back where the cursor ended. And then that allows you to, again, call this function to move the cursor up across the whole data set. When you've hit the end of the data, or when you've hit the end of the partition, um, with the cursor end, then you know that your scan's complete. Um, the next step, so we have, we have check reporting, we have like a way to actually, or we have check running, a way to run the checks. Next is reporting. So you wanna, you wanna have a clear grasp on what is the results of these checks and how do we make sure that we actually know what's going on. Um, so there's three main, main graphs that I think that you should pay attention to um, after all these checks. There's the previous run, how many violations you found in that run. And that's how you pay attention to, like, like that's what the team should compile and send out and use to decide what should we be tackling next. Um, if the previous run shows that you're all clear, then that's great. But if the previous run shows problems, then that's when you dig into it. The current run is useful for getting a feel for what's starting to be found but it's not as useful as the previous run. Um, and finally, you want some notion of like cursor progress because that helps you know when you can expect the previous run or a run to finish and when you can expect to actually try the results. Um, the previous run, if there's any amount of non-zero violations, that's when the team should get paged and you should be triaging the bug and starting to figure out the root cause and remediating it. Remediating is, I guess, like a script that you like run over the partitions and as you check the data, you also correct it. There's some things that I want to highlight in remediation that people at Dropbox have messed up before and I think is terrifying. The main thing that's terrifying is when the correction scripts 
actually corrupt the data even more. Um, and that, it kind of sounds like, oh, like that's amateur hour. I wouldn't make that mistake, ha ha. Um, but it's very common for these correction scripts, since they're running through the whole data set, they're actually another um, system that has to operate at scale. And those like race conditions and like hardware unreliability bugs and all that, that's going to affect your correction scripts also. Um, so when you run these scripts, you need to be able to back up your data and make sure you can reapply that data. And after the script runs, you need to recheck the data to make sure that you didn't corrupt it even more. And if you did make the data worse, then your correction script needs to back off. Um, or else you're going to make it worse. Like, you don't want to make it worse. It's bad times and like instant reviews, like kind of awkward. Um, then one more thing. You want to check the checkers. Um, so this is another like thing where it's, it becomes amateur hour. Um, we actually had, or not even we, I built a checker and deployed it in production and told everyone, like, we've got checking. Like, this is great. Like, you should all feel confident now. And it turns out in stage cluster, like, the scanner worked great. But in the production cluster, I forgot a config. And we have, like, all this whole data set. And we just scanned the first batch over and over and over. Um, and that cursor never got updated. So we just scanned the first batch over and over. And it looks like, well, it looks like checks are running, because I had metrics on how many checks run per second, but not really on like cursor progress or the fact that um, things were moving. And so to check the checkers, the, the way I recommend is to actually drop in real corruptions and make sure that the checkers find these corruptions. Um, there's like, at SRECON and stuff, there's always talk of like DRTs, disaster recovery, resilience, whatever, tests. Um, at Dropbox, we kind of bucket this into that kind of case. Um, but I guess I didn't need to say that. But um, really, test the checkers by injecting real data. Um, and yeah, thanks for stopping by. Um, that was my talk. <laughs>